And it is now here, the EU, if you just joined us, openly announcing that they're going to go into member states and take over their militaries and not let them leave. They're using the word super state. Lord Moncton, you predicted it. It's now documented. I, I, am, I am faint of breath. I mean, I quite frankly, uh, I don't get butterflies when I'm speaking to a crowd of 10,000 people. I have butterflies right now because I just feel the history is happening. History was indeed made by the British people on the 23rd of June, which is already being called Independence Day here in the UK. And you might like to know, Alex, that the film Independence Day Resurgence was very carefully timed so that it premiered in the UK on the 23rd of June, and I've already seen it. So there is a great movement afoot now of ordinary people the moment they get the chance to have their say, and governments in Britain have been trying for decades to deny them the chance to have their say, and in the end it was Nigel Farage, to whom you've quite correctly paid tribute, it was he who for decades has been at the front line battling this. He who, who transformed UKIP into a useful fighting machine, he who terrified David Cameron so much before the last election that Cameron promised us a referendum in the hope of getting just enough votes to win, which he got, but then he had to hold the referendum he promised, and he couldn't win that because the British people have spoken, and they've spoken decisively enough, 52% to 48, and as our former Prime Minister William Pitt said, and he said this just after we'd won the Napoleonic War, uh, a previous victory against uh, an overmighty totalitarian... I almost mentioned Pitt Europe. when I was talking about British-style George Washingtons. Go ahead. Well, let, let, uh, let's uh, give the quote that he gave in his speech to the Mansion House uh, dinner uh, just before his death. It was the last speech he made. It was his shortest and his most eloquent. All he said was, England has saved herself by her exertions and will, as I trust, save Europe by her example. And I think we are now seen very widely throughout Europe as being the voice of reason and sense and liberty against this increasingly cloying and increasingly aggressive totalitarian EU. And of course the left, which are totalitarian by instinct and by their belief, they welcome the idea that uh, the likes of you and me, Alex, should be locked up for pointing out that the world is not getting warmer at anything like the rate that the left had predicted that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, effectively a communist organization, they predicted a rate of warming that simply hasn't come to pass. It's not happening. So now here we have a proposal again from the left in the EU, this time to bring forward the proposal for a so-called EU army by which they make all the armies of the member states into one army, commanded, of course, by the unelected commissars, not uh, answerable to any elected parliament. So people start and saying you're taking they're... over, you're arresting people, you're not letting them have speech, you're tax exempt. Their answer is, we're going to take your army over. I mean, that's true occupation, is it not? Well, it, it is indeed. And what, what we have got here is now a gallop towards formal dictatorship. And the question is whether there are still enough independent-minded media around to speak out. You won't hear a word of criticism of this on the BBC, for instance. And this is a big problem. The media have been captured by these people. It's so, so it's Let me ask you this, because you've worked in media. You've been a top newspaper editor, top advisor to Margaret Thatcher. Just briefly, and then get back to the, I mean, this is really a dictatorship openly announcing itself, not since Hitler invaded, in my view, have we seen a threat this serious, not even the Soviet Union, because people knew that's an outside group. It didn't have much of a chance. But, but, but specifically, the arrogance, the boldness of the left, the radical Islamists, these imams that call for violence supporting the EU. I mean, it's really just a, a, a crew of motley trash. Well, what has happened is that the governing class worldwide, the class politique, as the French call it, they have been making common totalitarian cause. You've got the two kinds of totalitarianism, the corporatists who like to be involved with big business and get big business to go along with them. Those are the fascists. Then you've got the communists. The, the open collectivists, and that they're now finding common cause for the first time. They battled each other in the 20th century, but now they are standing together against liberty. And that's the significance of this European army move. Uh, it's that they're so desperate. They know that the peoples of Europe do not love them. 
They know that they have failed to deliver what would we would regard as useful European government. So they are now panicking and saying, how can we cling by the fingernails to this empire of bureaucracy that we have created, even though it's hated by the peoples of Europe? And the answer, of course, is to get the governing elites of Europe to join together, just as they did in trying to bully us into voting for uh, staying in the European Union, and that failed. So now they're going to do it by force, just as in the United States, as you rightly point out, there's a growing movement, and it's now almost official part of the democratic platform, that anybody who actually comes out and says, hang on a moment, there are serious scientific problems with this climate change nonsense, can be arrested and detained and put on trial for that. But here's the difficulty. For as long as they're still talking about putting people on trial, there is at least the chance that you might get a fair trial because the great thing about a trial is that both sides are heard. The danger with the European army proposal is that there is no court to whom anyone in Europe can appeal if their, if their governing class decides to go down this route. Because then that common European army will be established. And let us be quite clear, its aim is not to do what NATO does to protect the member states of NATO so that if any one of those states is invaded... Its aim is to keep countries within the system. They admit. To and come to its aid. This is an internal army designed to suppress the will of the people and keep them cowering in fear and to kick down the door, just like the KGB, if the people disagree with them. That is what the European army is about. That's why uh, they, they want a European army as well as NATO, because NATO already deals with the external defence of Europe. It's NATO that's kept the peace and kept the Russians and everybody else at bay. So why do they need a European army as well as NATO? Answer, because NATO is explicitly forbidden to police the internal affairs of member states. It and member states contribute to NATO. It's, it's not commanded by NATO itself. So it goes back to the more republic uh, strategy, uh, but in a military coalition, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Now, Lord Moncton, we're going to skip this network break so we have more time. I wanted to get Kit Daniels briefly, one of our writers that's been writing about this. Uh, and, and we have another writer, um, Clifford Cunningham, who wrote about this last week, proposed EU army hidden from British voters until after Brexit. And, and then right after they they bring it out, uh, just showing the amazing stealth of this. Kit Daniels? Yes, Alex. Uh, yesterday, uh, it was on Thursday, I believe, I posted this article from our new guy, uh, Clifford Cunningham. And now this is before Brexit even happened. He said that as citizens of the United Kingdom prepare to cast their votes in a nationwide referen referendum to decide whether or not to leave the European Union, a plan detailing the initial framework of the creation of the U EU <coughs> army is being kept hidden from the public until the day after the vote. So now the EU bureaucrats are claiming that this whole EU army program is a response to Brexit, but this proves that it was not at all. They had this plan for months. But that, exactly, but, but I mean, isn't it even more outrageous, Lord Monks, and then going back to Kit briefly? Daniels, that that their answer is, we're not going to let you leave. I mean, I'm reading the draft of it, and it says, we're going to keep you in. We're one shared common group. Basically, we're going to make it harder for you to leave. They're admitting that, hey, you didn't get to vote to enter this. We're this unelected, and we're going to let you thought. leave. Now, this, this European army idea has, in fact, been kicking around for a long time, and it's been gathering dust, but also gathering momentum among the totalitarian left, because they, since the, the fall of fascism and communism, the left have not had armies like that of Hitler and of Stalin at their disposal. And so they want, they, they realize now they cannot out-argue us. They cannot speak against democracy and expect to be heard by democracy. They tried that. And even with all the elites backing only one side of the vote, it's the other side, the democratic side, that carried the day in Britain. So now, although I was born in a democracy, I do not live in one, I shall die in one. So the British people have won that. But the response, it's not a response to Brexit, this European army plan. It's been around for, for actually at least 
15 years. It's amazing. And gathering momentum all that time. And as I say, the significance of this European army and the fact that only now are they admitting the latest stage in its development, as they knew perfectly well that there would be an even larger negative vote against the EU sure. if this had come out in public. This just shows how little they care for how ordinary people think. Lord well, Monkton, I want to go back to you in a moment. I, I, I want to go back to you in a moment, but I want to have Kit be able to chime back in one more time because he's been on this beat writing about it. But then I want to ask you, Moncton, so ruminate on this for about a minute. You've told us which shoe was going to drop next, years before it happened. Please tell us what you expect from the EU next, what their scams are going to be, how we counter this. And do you agree with me that regardless, it's, a, it's one of the biggest victories in modern history against totalitarianism because we force the fact that, yes, we don't get to vote. You're unelected. Uh, world government's now out in the open. We've got world leaders like Donald Trump and Nigel Farage t uh, talking about mega banks. I mean, it seems to me this is just uh, absolutely uh, devastating events that in the end will sink these people. But just like Hitler didn't know he was beaten at Leningrad or at the Battle of the Bulge in the Ardennes, uh, they're still going to fight on for a while. So I want to get your take, Lord Moncton, uh, in just a moment. Uh, finishing up, Kit, other points. Yeah, I'm working on an article right now, Alex. I saw CNN yesterday. And they brought in a former ambassador, Christopher Hill, who, uh, who said, quote, the only way to make Europe more than the sum of member state diplomacies is to make it into a real state. Multilevel governance may be just about satisfactory for managing mountains of butter, but is barely suitable for making decisions about guns. And CNN brought this guy on as a, as a quote, interview, but it's a little more than a propaganda piece. Let me respond to that and then get Lord Moncton's response then to my three questions if you can remember them. Look. Again, you look at the EU, it's always been there to destroy the nation states, get them into debt, and then fold them into the super state. They wrote about that 50 years ago. So their conspiracy is public to those that are learned. It's not debatable. The problem is the general public now begins to understand that this is a wicked organization. But how do we take them to the next level to understand it's always been premeditated? Uh, Lord Moncton. The first thing to do is to understand that this has now become, it didn't start as a premeditated attempt to take away democracy, but it has rapidly become exactly that as the people who uh, are behind all this realized how feeble the response of nation states would be when they needed to defend themselves. And already what is happening as a result of this vote is that there are about three and a half to four million signatures on a petition demanding there should be a rerun of the referendum referendum in Britain because they don't like the result. It'll be just like Denmark and Ireland, where they were made to vote again and vote again until they got the result that the governing class wanted. And only then was that referendum regarded as final. The same thing is now being attempted even with the British people. And I can tell you, we're not going to like that very much. We are going to oppose this very vigorously. The more the governing establishment tries to discredit and dishonor and not to implement that referendum, the more strongly the support for freedom will grow among ordinary people. And eventually the Conservative Party, which is deeply divided on this and half of which still wishes that it could overturn this referendum and simply carry on as though it hadn't happened. You've got the whole of the Labour Party, which is effectively communist under its present leader, Jeremy Corbyn, now in disarray. But the disarray is mainly sure. due to an argument about how far they should push a reversal of the people's will. Okay, but am I right, though, that the, the parliamentary bill that will be necessary to break us free of Europe, the referendum on its own doesn't do it. Parliament then has to do the people's will. And with the likes of the Labour Party and the Scottish National Workers' Party, all these parties that are left-wing, the so-called Liberal, so-called Democrats, who are neither, the so-called Greens, who are the destroyers of the planet. These people, they're all on the far left. From, from I understand, but long term... They are going to fight and fight and fight to make sure that they will use the majority that they can muster in Parliament, together with a whole lot of Conservatives who aren't really Conservative at all, to vote down any bill to give effect... So that's their Britain, next scam. Let me ask European you this then. Union. That's going to be the next battle. Sure. I mean, just brief questions here fast, because I want your view on this. But do you agree with me, though, that the genie's out of the bottle, it's going to be a long fight, but there's no way, uh, I mean, unless it's a total dictatorship, that they're ever going to be able to keep this thing in place? How long until you think Europe finally falls apart? 
The people have spoken here in Britain. They haven't been allowed to speak almost everywhere else. Where they have been allowed to speak, they have tended to uh, be told to go and uh, vote again and vote again until they get the answer sure. the elites want. That technique will no longer work. There is now a need for something I've mentioned before, which is an international grouping to advance the cause of liberty. No longer, if we stand alone as national parties, will we be strong enough to defeat That's this my next question about Trump. totalitarian monster you've talked about an open society of governments and peoples working together in shared cause so that the globalists just don't act like they're the only ones trying to have humanity come together why have we given them that power we need something to counter that we do. We now need a, a freedom international. I don't know what we'll call it, but something like that, which uh, is a, a subscription membership party, which everybody joins from America, from Britain, from all the other countries of Europe and the Commonwealth and everywhere else where liberty still matters. Because if we don't stand together now, then we'll fall. As uh, I think it was Benjamin Franklin used to we'll say. We'll hang separate. We must all hang together, or assuredly we shall all hang separately. And, and, and listen, I mean, Nigel Farage, uh, I, I mean, I cannot stress, and yourself and the rest of the party, you kept coming from nowhere, now the fastest growing party in Europe, uh, other parties joining, other parties picking up the nationalist rhetoric. Uh, this is beautiful. Le Pen, all the rest of it. I mean, this is clearly rising, and globally, this could bring in the new renaissance. Remember that this is not a nationalist movement, UKIP. What UKIP is, is a democratic, freedom-loving movement. We are not there to say a nation-state is the only way we can conduct our affairs. We are there to say that a European superstate that we do not elect and that our people cannot control, that is not the way forward for Europe any more than it is for our country. Where they we arrest people for their speech, where they, where they exempt themselves from taxes. I mean, it's a new royalty, isn't it? They exempt themselves from taxes. Worse, they exempt themselves also from civil suit and from criminal prosecution. And the, the people who run the, the, uh, the central yeah, stability... Yeah, yeah. Pact, tell folks who I these have. new sovereigns are on these, on these bureaucracies and how they set those up briefly. I mean, this is amazing. Well, for instance, the, the European Stability Pact is a good example. This is the thing that was intended to address the collapse in the euro, which is still, of course, collapsing and will collapse still faster now that Britain's voted out. But... Uh, they, they set up a governing body of absolute bankers, and these bankers have, have been given by the treaty establishing the Stability Pact total immunity from civil suit or criminal prosecution for any actions they take. And one of their actions that they are empowered by this treaty to take is to order any member state of the Stability Pact, fortunately not including Britain, to hand over any amount of money that they demand. That's the bail-in. As soon as they demand it. And that's how they're and able they to install leaders, too. That's how they're able to tell uh, you know, places like Greece uh, or Italy, hey, you know, here's your new leader. Back in 70 seconds with final comments from Lord Monkton and Kit Daniels. This is so incredible. World dictatorship is their goal. I'm telling you, it's amazing. Stay with us. All right. Uh, again, I get upset. I start hyperventilating when we sit here and see open tyranny being set up and the general public's in a coma. I don't normally disagree with Lord Moncton because he's one of the leading experts on the uh, EU tyranny and advised Margaret Thatcher on to oppose going into it and you know, spoke out against it. I mean, this is an unelected bureaucracy of mega banks taking over countries and installing leaders. But just a closing comment from him and then one from Kit Daniels ahead of our next guest. We're going to Supreme Court rulings and, and, and more on Brexit uh, coming up. I look at the euro, how they claim they set it up as a you know, steel trade deal, an economic commission and all this. And I've seen some of the leaders of the euro admit it was set up to consolidate control. I think it's been a tyranny from the beginning and, and, uh, and certainly is a naked tyranny now. I mean, why do you say it wasn't started as a tyranny, Lord Moncton? originally at least this was the official declared purpose let's be clear about this as a means of it was called the european coal and steel community its job was to make sure there was enough coal and steel to rebuild europe after the second world war that was its ostensible that was the purpose. treaty of london and in, in 48 wasn't it and then in 56 the treaty of rome and the treaty of rome was where it began to diverge from that original purpose and because the treaty uh, that set up the Coal and steel community was a purely technocratic treaty just to make sure there's enough coal and steel to go round. That didn't need to be run democratically. But the people who then decided they would try and create a European superstate moved in, people like Jean Monnet, 
And they quite explicitly said, well, we don't want democracy. What we want is the governing elite to come together and form a Europe which we the dictators will run and by the you way know, the german the, the german the president just interrupt lost the war then promptly moved in and tried to do bureaucratically what they couldn't do by force of arms and that that has been the continuing problem with it ever since and that is why in the end the likes of me who at first were in favor of the free trade area which the european union originally was when it was just the european communities we turned against it when it began galloping towards being the the super exactly. state that everyone can now see it becoming and in closing let me ask you this question uh, infowars.com story german president there's video says the elites are not the problem this is a quote the populations of the problem close quote are these people completely mentally ill why are they so arrogant why do they admit everything about world government but then have their media say it doesn't exist they are so arrogant precisely because the media have been so comprehensively captured and if there's one book you need to read to work out how this was done then it's eon mihai pachepa who was the head of the securitate uh, the under ceausescu's romania and he headed the disinformation directorate of the kgb whose sole function was to denigrate and destroy the reputations of all the enemies of communism throughout europe and they managed to recruit a million European communists That's right. to help out in... Uh, and even after they fell, the, the brainwashed European communists have continued the mission. They have indeed <laughs> continued the mission, uh, e even though Pacepa eventually defected to the West and wrote a book saying that there were a million of them. When I tell people it was that many, they express shock and they just think I'm some kind of Reds Under the Beds merchant. But the phrase Reds Under the Beds was invented by Pacepa. It was invented as part of... Well, sure, of they the declassified country. a bunch of KGB this files a few years ago and it was all documented. In fact, why don't you it's review that out. book for us and come back on and do a full hour about the controlled media in the future. ScienceofPublicPolicy.org, we salute you. Congratulations, Lord Moncton, and thank you for your fight it's got to feel good to come from nowhere in the last 30 years and you and farage and others to be leading a global movement uh, that i just feel honored to be part of sir and, and trump is as well well god bless you and thank you for your help alex it's been absolutely vital well thank you it's amazing well, we're not lying down that's for sure uh kit uh, thank you for riding shotgun with us more articles at Infowars. quick comment uh kit daniels well, it's interesting alex you said earlier that the eu is a nazi program now it's interesting to point out that the uh, Nazi Germany was not a technocracy, but they did put technocrats in power. And that's what the Trilateral Commission grew out of in the 70s. You know, you had two separate movements, the U.S. technocracy and the German technocracy. The German technocracy is what survived. I think the uh, U.S. technocracy died in the 30s at the outbreak of World War II. So, yeah, it's like not, uh, Adolf Hitler was the last person to create a European super state. So, yeah, this is a Nazi. It's program. incredible. Thank you, kid. Thank you, Lord Moncton.